We are more than a location. We are more than a building. We are the people of God. We live for the gospel of Jesus Christ. We are Cleveland Baptist. For more information about our church and our live streams, head over to www.clevelandbaptist.com. Good evening, Cleveland Baptist, and welcome to our monthly Sunday night services. My name is Matthew Rafton, and I'll be bringing the word of the Lord tonight. And we want to welcome our visitors who are tuning in tonight, and we pray that this would be an encouraging time for you and your walk with Jesus. But praise be to God for his word. So tonight we are reading from 1 Samuel chapter 16, from verses 1 to 13. So if you have a Bible, I would invite you to open them to 1 Samuel 16. And while you're doing that, why don't you bow with your heads? Why don't you bow your heads with me and let's pray to our Lord. Father and our God, we thank you for your word. Father, we thank you for the one whom your word testifies about, the Lord Jesus Christ. And Father, we pray in this time that you would open our ears to hear wonderful things in your word. Open our eyes to behold the word of the Lord. Father, strengthen the saints, save the sinners, and may Jesus Christ be exalted. In his name we pray. Amen. So now I would like to start off tonight just by asking one simple question. And it's up to you on how deep you decide to take this question. But this question is simply this, is God faithful? Is God trustworthy? So in our portion of scripture tonight, we're going to be seeing three practical points. So firstly, we'll see a promise is given for a test of faith. Then secondly, we're going to see the reality of the human heart. And then thirdly, we're going to see that the promise is fulfilled to bring hope. In the anointing of David, we see the great sovereignty of God over all things. And we see the great providence of God in that he is providing for himself a king after his own heart for the reformation of Israel. But what we will ultimately see is the promise of the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ rooted and woven into the history of Israel. So now join with me, we'll just read from verses 1 to 5, and as I preach through this, we'll just go through in certain sections. So verses 1 to 5. The Lord said to Samuel, How long will you grieve over Saul, since I have rejected him from being king over Israel? Fill your horn with oil and go. I will send you to Jesse the Bethlehemite, for I have provided for myself a king among his sons. And Samuel said, How can I go? If Saul hears it, he will kill me. And the Lord said, take a heifer with you and say, I've come to sacrifice to the Lord and invite Jesse to the sacrifice and I will show you what you shall do. And, and you shall anoint for me him whom I declare to you. So Samuel did what the Lord commanded and came to Bethlehem. The elders of the, of the city came to meet him trembling and said, do you come peaceably? And he said, peaceably, I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Consecrate yourselves and come with me to the sacrifice. And he consecrated Jesse and his sons and invited them to the sacrifice. So God begins with this two-sided statement to Samuel. How long will you grieve over Saul since I have rejected him from being king over Israel? So currently Samuel is in a state of grief because the kingdom of Israel has been torn from the hands of Saul and therefore the, the state of Israel is looking very dire. But God reaffirms Samuel that this is a part of his plan and that his rejection of Saul stands, but that he is to go and anoint another king. So God continues. He says, fill your horn with oil and go. I will send you to Jesse the Bethlehemite for I have provided for myself a king among his sons. So God gives Samuel two different commands. The first one is fill your horn with oil. 
And this means that Samuel is to make preparations to publicly seal and set apart a person for service to God. And in this case, he was to set apart a king for the ministry of governing God's people. And then we see that the second command is go. God has promised a king and now Samuel must respond in faith to what God has revealed to him. Now notice how God did not say, if you go, then I'll find a king for you to anoint. No, God says, Samuel, get up and go. For I have seen to it that a king will reign over my people and you will anoint him. Now, just as God sent Samuel, God sends his servants, but he does not send them blindly. There is always something anchored and immovable to have faith in. And so in this case, Samuel's faith wasn't actually resting in the king that God had chosen, but rather Samuel had faith in the faithfulness and in the providence of the almighty God. Now, what was God's promise for Samuel to have faith in? Well, it's in the back end of verse 1, where the Lord says, For I have provided for myself a king. So the word provided used here means to see. And this is just like how God saw the oppression of his people in Egypt. And so now in this current time, he sees the oppression of his people under the leadership of Saul. And God in his great providence is going ahead of his people and parting the waters to provide salvation. But now Samuel is in a place where he must take God at his word. God wanted Samuel to walk by faith and not by sight. But what about you? Are you walking by faith and not by sight? Do you trust in the providence of the almighty God? Do you trust in Jehovah Jireh, the Lord God, our great provider? So just consider this thought for a moment. I am a carpenter by trade and I build houses. But the end goal that I should always have is to build a structurally sound house. And to build a structurally sound house, I need a set of engineering plans. And on these engineering plans that I get are all the critical details that I need for the structure of this house. It has wind forces for different wall bracing requirements. It has connect connection details and points for steel members and timber members. It has tie down requirements to actually stop the house from blowing away in a storm. But the point is, is that if I'm ever unsure if I've ever done enough, or if I'm even doing the right thing, I refer to the requirements of the engineering plans. But it's not that I have faith only in the plans, but ultimately I have faith in the knowledge of the engineer who designed those plans. So whether really the structure stands or falls actually comes back to the integrity of the engineer and whether what he has detailed in those plans is trustworthy. And so this corresponds over to our Christian walks of faith. The Bible provides God's engineering plans for our lives and God himself is the engineer of our salvation. But just remember, we don't only trust in a book with pages and words and verses and chapter divisions. We trust in the faithfulness of our heavenly father who has spoken to us in his word. Consider Psalm 25. All the paths of the Lord are steadfast love and faithfulness. Psalm 26, your steadfast love is before my eyes and then I walk in your faithfulness. How in these times we must rely upon the faithfulness of our God and walk in it. It is in these times of crisis we are reminded that we are not in control. We cannot manipulate COVID-19. The coronavirus does not bow the knee to humans. And we need to know the promises of God so that we may stand firm and not be tossed around by the storms of life. In times of trial and sufferings like these, it is our only steadfast hope to point our eyes heavenward and to fix our eyes upon Jesus. And where else shall we turn to? Only he is the way, the truth and the life. Only he 
is our mighty fortress. We must take up our shields of faith and stand firm on the word. But what if you're listening in tonight and you're not a Christian? Can you trust what God says? Can you trust in the son God sent into the world to save sinners? Consider the words of Jesus. I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And now just think about this. Who does that promise ultimately rely upon? Does it rely on you or does it rely on the Lord Jesus Christ? You must respond in faith and choose to believe in Jesus. That is your responsibility. But as I have laboured, the integrity of the promise does not rest upon the strength of your feeble faith, but it rests upon the faithfulness of the one whom we put our faith in. So my question to you is, if you're, not, if you're not a Christian, will you put your faith in Jesus? And for us who are Christians and believers, even though our faith is the side of a mustard seed, will we walk by faith in Jesus? Will we trust in Christ, the solid rock? Back to our text. Samuel seems somewhat reluctant to respond positively here. And most, positive, uh, most probably, he is afraid of getting caught committing treason against the king. But God provides clear instructions as a way for him to escape the anger of Saul. So God tells Samuel, take a heifer, go and sacrifice to me. You, you are to invite Jesse and his household. I will show you what to do. You shall anoint him whom I declare. So Samuel did what the Lord commanded him. He decided to take God at his word. Then the elders of the city are afraid of Samuel. They come trembling to meet him. Do you come peaceably, they ask? Peaceably I come, but I've come to sacrifice to the Lord. Samuel then requests that the elders set themselves apart for this particular sacrifice, and he invites Jesse and his sons to partake in it. And so now the scene is set. Who is the Lord's anointed. Follow with me as we read verses 6 to 11. And when they came, he looked on Eliab and thought, surely the Lord's anointed is before me. But the Lord said to Samuel, do not look on his appearance or on the height of his stature, because I have rejected him. For the Lord sees not as man sees. Man looks on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. Then Jesse called Abinadab and made him pass before Samuel. And he said, neither has the Lord chosen this one. Then Jesse made Shema pass by. And he said, neither has the Lord chosen this one. And Jesse made seven of his sons pass before Samuel. And Samuel said to Jesse, the Lord has not chosen these. Then Samuel said to Jesse, are all your sons here? And he said, there remains yet the youngest, but behold, he is keeping the sheep. And Samuel did uh, and sorry, and Samuel said to Jesse, send and get him, for we will not sit down till he comes here. So what we are witnessing in verses 6 to 11 here is God doing some serious work with Samuel in light of earlier events of 1 Samuel. You see, Israel wanted a king. And even though God himself was their king, 1 Samuel chapter 8 records the rejection of God as their king and Israel's desire for a human king like their neighboring countries. This is another biblical pattern. And we see the true condition of the Israelites and the true condition of all mankind. And the problem here is, is that we do not listen to the voice of God, but we allow the lusts of our eyes to lead us. And so the Israelites take part here in Paul's indictment of the human race in Romans 1 where they exchanged the glory of God for a human king fashioned from their sinful hearts. And they acted just like their forefathers who exchanged the glory of God on Mount Sinai for a measly golden calf. And so God gave them over to the sinful desires of their hearts. And God gave them over to the leadership of Saul. 
But now Samuel is put to the test here as the sons of Jesse come before him. Will he fall into the same trap as the Israelites did? Now, according to 1 Chronicles 2, Eliab was Jesse's eldest son. And so Eliab held the place of prestige and of superiority within the family setup. His name, which means my God is father, surely expresses that if anyone's going to be king, it must be Eliab. So Samuel looked upon Eliab and what he saw was pleasing to his eyes. And commentators have suggested that at this point, had it been solely up to Samuel, he would have never chosen David. But God is sovereign and he has declared and promised that he has provided for himself a king. Samuel here is not to do the choosing. He is to anoint whom the Lord declares. Samuel is to allow the voice of God to lead him. And so then God corrects Samuel. He says, do not look on his appearance or on the height of his stature because I have rejected him. For the Lord sees not as man sees. Man looks on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks upon the heart. God sees not as man sees. And unfortunately, man fails to see as God sees. Samuel's eyes are drawn to his outward appearance and his physical attributes. And in his mind at this point, to be king, you need to be tall, strong and handsome, just like Saul was. And realistically, why would you not want that? If you were to have a king who stood, resembled and was military excellence, doesn't it make sense that he at least looked the part for the job? And our world grooms us to judge by appearances in this manner. We are always tempted to be led by what looks good and to categorise people's abilities by their appearances. Have you judged anyone like this? Has anyone judged you like this? Think about how that felt for a minute. Even the great Son of God, Lord Jesus himself, was judged in the same way. Because even though he was the Son of God in the flesh, his contemporaries accused him of not fitting into their specific categories. You see, when they looked at him, they thought, how can this be the Christ? He is so meek. He is so humble. He's so gentle. How could the Holy One of Israel sit in the midst of the scum of society? How can we believe in a crucified Messiah? So in God correcting Samuel, he reveals a profound truth. And this verse has major implications for all of us. God looks at the heart. That's how he judges us. And that's how he examines us, every single one of us. He looks at my heart. He looks at your heart. What does God see in your heart right now? Consider the words of Jeremiah 17. The heart is deceitfully wicked above all things and desperately sick. Who can comprehend it? I, the Lord, search the heart, test the mind. What about Proverbs 21? Every way of a man is right in his own eyes, but the Lord weighs the heart. The Apostle John writes about Jesus Christ, that he himself knew what was in every man. And in warning his disciples about the wickedness of the Pharisees, Jesus said, nothing is covered up that will not be hidden or hidden that will not be made known. Dear friends, the Lord Jesus Christ, the one of pure, holy eyes, the one who has blazing eyes of fire, is searching our minds. He is testing our hearts at this very moment. God can see the condition of our hearts. He knows if they're wicked. He knows if they're pure. He knows if our hearts are dead stones of sin. He knows if our hearts have been made alive by the Spirit of God. But what's more, he can even see those sins that are stored so deeply in our souls that no one knows about them and that even we ourselves may not be aware of them. And on top of this, he weighs, them, he weighs the motives of, of our hearts on his scales of righteousness and he will call into account all that we have thought and done. So who will deliver us from such indwelling evils? Well, thanks be to God who has given us the victory in Jesus Christ. 
and our only fitting response to such grace is nothing in our hands we bring, but simply to that rugged cross we cling. Sin had left a crimson stain, but Jesus washed it white as snow. Verse 7 is key for Samuel. And God was teaching Samuel what he desired in the king, not what the people desired. Chapter 13 of 1 Samuel says this, The Lord has sought a man after his own heart, and the Lord has commanded him to be prince over his people. The king was to love the Lord his God with all of his heart, with all of his soul, with all of his mind, with all of his strength, and he was to govern the people of Israel in the fear of the Lord. So as we read on, Eliab was not the Lord's anointed. Abinadab wasn't the Lord's anointed. Shammah wasn't the Lord's anointed. And the other four sons of Jesse were not the Lord's anointed. But notice how God doesn't say anything about the hearts of David's brothers. It's left somewhat up in the air for the reader to think about here. Now, just remember, this does not necessarily mean that they, had, um, that they did not have blameless hearts before God. But as it is simply written in the word of the Lord, Eliab I have rejected as king, and the Lord has not chosen these as king. Now, this may seem a bit unfair to us, but it's a sobering reminder that God alone has the supreme authority to choose one person over another. He chose Isaac over Ishmael. He chose Jacob over Esau. He chose Israel over all the nations of the world. He chose Joseph over his brothers. He chose David over his brothers. And Jesus tells his disciples that you did not choose me, but I chose you. But this big question still remains, and that is why did God choose David? If not his brothers, why did God choose David? So Psalm 78, 70 to 72, I believe beautifully illustrates this balance of God's sovereign choice of David, but also explains the condition of David's heart and how these two truths work together. It says, the Lord chose David his servant. The Lord took David from the sheepfolds to shepherd Jacob his people. And with an upright heart, David shepherded them. Now, it is important to note who acted upon who here. And when God made a covenant with David, he reminds him of this by saying, I, the Lord, took you um, you from the pasture that you should be prince over my people. David certainly had an upright heart, and I'm not denying that. But we've got to see that it was God who was the one who called him to be king. God didn't have to call David. He could have easily just left David in the sheepfold, but he chose him and used him and his upright heart for the sake of Israel. It's also important to understand that the Bible never actually says that David had a good heart and that was his merit to earn the throne. But rather the scriptures say that he had an upright heart, a blameless heart, and that he was a man after God's heart. Kevin DeYoung wrote an article for League and Their Ministries and comments on the meaning of David's heart in this very first Samuel 16 account. He says this, David saw his transgressions primarily in their vertical dimension as an offence against the almighty God. He never ran from light when it exposed his darkness. And also in concluding his article, he writes, David was a man after God's own heart, because he hated sin, but he loved to forgive it. What better example of God could there be? And so for us, dear friends, having a blameless heart before God means that you confess, you repent, and you lament of all that he has said about your sinful nature. You declare that you are poor in spirit and you come before the throne of grace and plead God to have mercy on your soul. That is why David was after God's own heart. It's because he wanted to deny all that he was and he wanted to cling to all that God is. And for us, that means that we must deny ourselves. We must take up our crosses 
and we must follow Jesus. But back to verse 11. This is looking very discouraging for Samuel at the moment. But he was standing firm on the promise of the Lord. There was one son of Jesse remaining. This had to be the Lord's anointed. Now finish reading with me from verses 12 to 13. And he sent and brought him in. Now he was ruddy and handsome and had beautiful eyes. And the Lord said, Arise, anoint him, for this is he. Then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the midst of his brothers. And the spirit of the Lord rushed upon David from that day forward. And Samuel went up and went to Ramah. Now, what's interesting here is that back in verse 7, God makes a big point about not judging by mere appearances. But here in verse 12, the Bible makes a point of describing David's appearances. So why is this so? Well, Matthew Henry in his commentary suggests that in spite of the harsh working environments of being a shepherd, David's natural beauty outshone his dirty shepherd's clothing. And so veiled under the shepherd's dirty clothes was natural beauty. And the fact that David was a young boy made his beauty unadulterated and innocent. He was not a boy out for selfish gain, but he was an honest, hard worker who had a radiance about him. And this is a wonderful image of a meek man who had integrity, inner integrity. And now God's chosen king has been identified. The Lord commands Samuel, arise, anoint him, for this is he. And then Samuel anointed David in the midst of his brothers and the spirit of the Lord rushed upon David from that day forward. David was now set apart for the office of king. And even though he doesn't become king of Judah until 2 Samuel 2, the throne is his. The Lord has given it into his hands. David, uh, sorry, God used David greatly for the sake of his people. David shepherded the people of Israel with an upright heart and became a biblical model of a man after God's own heart. And David was also a great example that even though he had some major shortcomings, he had steadfast faith in the Lord. There is a lot that we can learn off David in the Bible. But so now the question is this. How does David fit into God's story of redemption? So who are we in this story? Where do we put ourselves in this story of 1 Samuel 16? Who is David representing? Are we David in this story? Do we dare assume that we are the hero in the Bible? Well, no, certainly not. Jesus Christ is David in this story. The Apostle Paul in his Acts 13 sermon writes this of David's part in redemptive history. He says this, of David's offspring, God has brought to Israel a saviour, Jesus, just as he promised. And Paul here links Jesus Christ to be the promised seed of David. And what we have seen here in 1 Samuel 16 is a foreshadowing of the one who is to come later and to be the seed of the woman. He would be the one who is the line of the tribe of Judah. He would be the one who is the ruler from Bethlehem who's coming forth is from old. He would be the one who is the, um, he would be the one who is the shoot from the stump of Jesse. He would be the one who is the root, the offspring of David. And he would be the one that David would write about saying, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. I am talking about Jesus Christ. But Jesus didn't come to patch up a fallen nation like David did. Jesus came to wage war on sin, on the internal condition that had infected the Israelites, Samuel, and even the great King David. And we are not excluded from that. For as Romans says, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. David was never meant to have success. His purpose in the story of God's redemption is to show us the need for an everlasting righteous king. And this greater king, this greater David, would stand in our place before God and he would clothe us in his righteousness and he would take away our filthy rags. He would take away our hearts of stone and he would put in us hearts of flesh, 
hearts that are responsive to God. Everything about Jesus is the perfect fulfillment of all that God promised in David. David's name means beloved, but Jesus is the beloved son of God. David is a shepherd, but Jesus is the great shepherd. Under the dirty shepherd clothes of David was natural beauty, but under the flesh of Jesus was the very glory and the radiance of the eternal God. David was anointed to save Israel from its enemies, but Jesus was anointed to save sinners from the clutches of sin. But Jesus did not come into the world as he so deserved to, but rather he emptied himself. By taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and he humbled himself to death, even death on a cross. And upon that cross, he died for the sins of all who would call upon his name. He paid their sin penalty with his own precious blood. Then he was buried in an empty tomb among the dead. But the king of glory rose from the dead and was exalted to the highest place. And now the call of this gospel goes out to all the nations and God commands all people everywhere to repent of your sins, to turn from your sins and believe upon the Lord Jesus Christ. And so tonight, if you are not a Christian, if you haven't figured this God thing out, you need to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. Has he saved you from your sins? Has the blood of the lamb, Jesus, washed you from all of your unrighteousness? Will you submit to him who is seated upon the throne of grace? Just remember this, that the mercies of Jesus are new every morning and that our sins are many, but the mercy of the risen King is much, much more. Call upon the name of Jesus Christ and you will be saved. And so as we close and consider what we have learnt tonight, we have so much to be encouraged by here. We can trust in the sovereign Lord because he is faithful to his promises. So will you take God at his word and walk by faith? We also learn that God does not look upon our appearances to judge us, but rather he looks at our hearts. So will you make every effort to walk blamelessly, to have an upright heart before the Lord? And finally, God has appointed for us King Jesus, who brings us believers to the heart of God. And if we want to be a people after the heart of God, our only fitting response is to walk humbly in the truth of the gospel by which we were first saved. Because we have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer we who live, but Christ who lives in us. And the life we now live, we live by faith in the Son of God who loved us and who gave himself for us. And he has promised to deliver us from all evil and wickedness and to bring us safely into his heavenly kingdom. Turn to Christ. Seek the things that are above. Look to Christ the solid rock and run your race with perseverance. Let's pray. Father and our God, we thank you for the wonderful truths of your word. We thank you for this portion of scripture and how you have proven your faithfulness to your promises and that the integrity of all of your promises rests solely upon yourself. And Father, we thank you that this ultimately has led us to the person of Jesus Christ, who is the great fulfillment, who is the yes and the amen of all of God's promises. And so, Lord, I pray for those who are listening. May you strengthen the saint and may you save the sinner. And may we walk by faith and not by sight, fixing our eyes upon you, Jesus. And may you lead us in, you, in your faithfulness, we pray. Amen.